Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you all doing? Um, yeah, I mean, you're all sort of hypothetical to me because I can't see any of you. Uh, but welcome. Welcome to uh, this edition of the Visiting Writer Series. <clears throat> Today we have um, a great writer and the newest addition uh, to the English department, uh, Professor Brandon Shimoda with us today. Um, but we do first wanna thank uh, the English department in the Visiting Writers Series, and of course uh, the McLean Fund for English and the support of uh, the press at Colorado College. Um, before we get started, we also um, want to acknowledge that Colorado College is located within the unceded territory of the Ute people. Um, the earliest documented people here also include the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. Um, this place has been a space for intellectual inquiry and creativity for a long time. And uh, we hope to do our part to continue that and to consider um, how to <clears throat> build a new world uh, beyond things such as land acknowledgements. Uh, so we're really excited for this reading. Um, and today to have <clears throat> to introduce Professor Shimoda, we have the student junior, uh, Theo Snowden. Theo. Hey everyone. Um, so thanks for being here with us today for uh, the third event of this year's Visiting Writer Series. Uh, this time with our very own Brandon Shimoda, Assistant Professor of English here at CC. Um, Professor Shimoda is the author of seven books of poetry and prose, including The Grave on the Wall, which received the Penn Open Award, and Evening Oracle, which received the William Carlos Williams Award for, from the Poetry Society of America. He earned his bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College and later his Master in Fine Arts for Creative Writing Poetry from the University of Montana. He has taught at the University of Arizona, Kaohsiung, American School in Taiwan, the University of Montana, Occidental College, Pacific Northwest College of the Arts and Willamette University, and Pima Community College Upward Bound. He is currently writing a book of creative nonfiction on the afterlife of Japanese American incarceration, which, in his own words, means also a book on anti Asian racism, erasure, ghosts, haunting, me memorialization, migrant detention, nostalgia, pilgrimage, poetry, post memory, protest, ruins, silence, storytelling transgenerational trauma, white supremacy, and the wind. Tonight, he will be reading from a different book in progress called Hydra Medusa, which will be published in 2023 by Nightboat Books. It is a book of poetry and prose from which he will be reading just prose excerpts tonight. When I asked Professor Nate Marshall about why he was excited to have Professor Shimoda here at CC, he recalled the first time he, recalled the first time he saw Professor Shimoda perform at a reading in Portland, Oregon. He said that he could tell very quickly the depth of perspective Professor Shimoda possesses, and he realized a particular intelligence in how he approached his own work. Professor Marshall said he admired those qualities and was delighted when he saw Professor Shimoda's application to a position at CC. While I was talking with Professor Shimoda about what drew him to want to teach, he said that one, of, that one way teaching excites him is how it allows him to share the questions he has about academia and the world broadly with bright undergrad students who bring new perspectives, and, new perspectives and ideas to the table, as has already been happening in his first block teaching that is now coming to an end. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to learn from and work with Professor Shimoda, and just as excited to hear some of his forthcoming work tonight. So without further ado, let's give a big, warm, virtual CC welcome to Professor Brandon Shimoda. Am I here? Yay. Um, who am I looking at? I'm looking at no one. Thank you, Theo. Uh, thank you, Nate. And uh, I'm going to thank the, the, visiting, the visiting writer series, uh, the people who put the visiting writer series together. I, I, I laugh because I'm, I'm one of the people who put, <laughs> puts the visiting writer series together. I'm transitioning from being a visitor into somebody who I guess is here. Uh, so that's uh, Nate Marshall. Thanks, Nate, again. Natanya Poli, Aileen Lowe, um, 
I also want to thank Aaron Kohick and Erica Hardcastle um, and my students and uh, my partner, Dot Devota, and our daughter, Yumi. Um, it's nice imagining everyone in this space. Um, webinar, of course, means I can't see people, but it's nice to think of some faces out there. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem from this book that I just got in the mail a week ago, um, which has quickly become my favorite book. So this is an anthology, bilingual Japanese American anthology that was edited by Janice Mirakatani, who was a poet and an activist who passed away in July, on July 29th. It's called Ayumi. And it's organized by generations. So the Issei, first generation, Nisei, uh, second generation, then Sansei and Yonsei generations. Those are the, those are, uh, the chapters of the anthology. I'm gonna read one of the shorter poems. This is a poem that um, is anonymous. It was written by somebody in one of the many uh, concentration camps, World War II concentration camps. Sprinkling, sprinkling, but the dust does not stay down. So that's from Ayumi. Okay. Um, as Theo said, I'm going to be reading from uh, my next book that's coming out, which is a book called Hydra Medusa. And it's poetry and prose that I wrote while living in Tucson, Arizona. Um, it's coming out from one of my favorite presses, Nightboat Books. And just a quick shout out to them because so many of my, uh, the writers that I most revere um, that sustain me, even when I'm, maybe especially when I'm having difficulty thinking and writing um, uh, are published by Nightboat. And I'm just gonna show three of these books. Um, they publish Atelidnan. This is Shifting the Silence, the most recent book from Atel. And then Jackie Wang's The Sunflower Cast a Spell to Save Us from the Void, which is actually a book that I shared with my students this block, um, nominated for a National Book Award. And then Divya Victor's Curb. Uh, they also actually published Divya's Kith. These are two of my favorite books, really astonishing. Um, and I also know that Div is here. So thank you for your work, Divya. Okay. So this is a, a selection of prose from Hydra Medusa. The book is actually called Hydra Medusa or Give Away the One You Want. I had a dream last night that a scream did not need a hill to gather speed to reach the people. I had a dream last night that the war fit on the tip of a finger. I had a dream last night that a border wall was built. Carved into the wall were millions of alcoves. In the center of each alcove was a bright red candied apple. The wall was a mausoleum, part altar, part orchard. I had a dream last night that a rainbow was burning. I had a dream last night that my daughter Yumi was the reincarnation of River Phoenix. I had a dream last night that I was watching a River Phoenix biopic starring a young Yo-Yo Ma, circa early 1980s. I had a dream last night that I was watching what was commonly agreed to be the most boring movie ever made, but which I found mesmerizing a single eight hour shot of a young woman pulling long black hair out of the drain of her bathroom sink. I lived years ago in Oaxaca. I rented a small house in Xochimilco, north of the city. The day before I returned to the United States, the shower clogged. I removed the drain stop, pulled hair out of the drain, poured chemicals, nothing worked. My landlord came over. 
He brought a snake, a wooden stool, and a glass of ice water. The stool and the ice water suggested it was going to take a while. He put the stool beneath the shower head, sat down, took a sip of water, then, chewing on a piece of ice, looked up at me and said, would you like to hear a poem? Sure, I said, over and under enthusiastically at once. Tell me what you think, he said. And feeding the snake into the drain, recited a poem about a woman who lived on the top of a mountain, surrounded by, and I remember this exactly, the ghosts of all the children to whom she wanted to speak but could not. The children were her children. They all died, all in accidents that had to do with living on top of a mountain, falling off a cliff, getting struck by lightning, getting folded into an avalanche. Each child was presented in a description of how they died. The descriptions were brief, a couple lines each. Then the children became ghosts and the woman returned to grieving and loneliness. The poem lasted much longer than the time it took my landlord to recite it, if that makes sense. He was moving the snake up and down like he was churning butter. At one point, he looked up at the shower head and squinted. When you squint, your face smiles. I mean, your cheeks lift. It is not that you are smiling, but your face, and maybe it is the opposite of smiling. When he pulled the snake out, it was covered in long black hair, but I was on top of the mountain with the woman. So the long black hair on the snake was the woman, and I felt sad about it. My mother, my landlord said, I wrote it about her. He ran his hand down the snake and pulled the long black hair loose. He held it in his fist like he was holding up a head by the hair. What do you think, he asked. The hair? My hair back then was neither long nor black. I was suddenly nervous and I felt even though, or maybe because I was feeling it like I did not know what to say. So I said, it's beautiful. And did that actually happen? A pitiful, unthinking question. I felt sorry for the ghosts, but my landlord treated it kindly. I had a dream last night that a young poet died in Tucson, Arizona. He was a friend, but we had not seen each other in years. I read his poetry, which over time and near the end of his life became prose. I decided to travel to Tucson to pay my respects. I had never been to Tucson, did not know anyone there. I thought I might encounter other poets, some I knew or even sort of knew around the city or at the grave, but there was no one. The graveyard was a small plaza of dirt surrounded by crumbling adobe. The graves were also dirt, some with grass, some of the grass still living, most of it dead. A film about the poet was projected on one of the walls. It was rough, the wall. The film cohered on the bricks, but was difficult to see up close. I watched until the film loop, looped back to where I had started. In one scene, the poet, shown in slow motion from behind, ran out the front door of a dark house into bright sun, then jumped over a narrow canal. From behind, he looked like a young Federico Garcia Lorca, black suit, black hair combed back. His shadow in the canal looked like how I imagined young Lorca's shadow might look, like a stingray flying beneath ice. Lorca, the poet, was 38 when he was executed by a right-wing militia in the Spanish countryside near Fuente Grande between Viznar and Alfacar in Granada. His body was buried in a ravine. Imagine jumping many years after dying over the exact spot where you were buried. Who are you here for? I heard someone say. There was what looked like a family gathered around a grave not far from where I was sitting. A few women, a few men, several children. They looked like they had been there all day. They looked like they had always been there. Everyone except for the children playing along one of the crumbling walls were looking at me. Sorry, who are you here for? A poet, I said. Then. A friend, a poet, one of the men said. I didn't know poets died. They all laughed like it was an inside joke. Poets die first, another one of the women said. She was talking to the man, but also to me. She was looking at me. 
They feel things more strongly, don't you think? Although I thought at first that she said strangely. The grave was a raised mound of earth with clumps of grass. On top of the grave were three cakes. With the family sitting around the cakes, the grave became a table. The cakes were white on paper plates, blue candles in each, unlit. I knew a poet once, another of the men said. The way he said it conjured images of a love affair, crimes of passion, even murder. Had he really only known one poet? My life was littered with poets. Maybe everyone I knew was a poet, which seemed suddenly to reflect very poorly, at least strangely, or maybe strongly on how I had spent my life. I tried to think of the first poet I had ever met when I was young, too young to know what a poet was or what they did. But in place of an image of a person was a void of erased air swimming before dark trees outside a public library. I almost manage a woman my grandmother's age, white hair dyed black, a brick wall, but I was reaching, I'm reaching now. I cannot remember the first poet I ever met. Poets appeared, then they were everywhere. And yet maybe it was as true for me as it might've been for the man. Maybe I knew a poet once. Two of the women got up, pulled knives out of a cooler. Another woman called to the children. The children playing along one of the crumbling walls appeared for a moment like candied apples in alcoves. The women started cutting the cakes. The grave looked like a body then, quietly breathing. The young poet and I had been friends, but I realized that because we had not seen each other in many years, there was little to distinguish between our relationship before he died and our relationship now that he was dead. I took for granted and without much imagination that the young poet was like everyone in my life whom I never see somewhere out there. Even though I rarely made the attempt to put myself there, to be there, to be sure. Now the young poet was dead and I was beside him. Death is what it took. I felt like a vulture. Sand blew across the skin of the grave. Who were the women and men and the children here for? Not once had, had they mentioned anyone's name. Then one of the women looked at me and said, do you want a piece of cake? Except it was not a question. She did not say do, but you want a piece of cake. I had a dream last night that I was floating face up like a corpse in a coffin and minus the coffin, down a long, low-ceilinged hallway, at the far end of which was a large doorway that opened onto a bright green forest filled with dozens of young, round-headed deer, all of them lying on top of each other asleep. I had a dream last night that all the consonants in my name were silent. I had a dream last night that I met a woman made of bricks, she took herself apart brick by brick and became a pile of bricks. I had a dream last night that a man gave a performance in which he visibly aged. When the performance began, he was young. By the end, he was old. The stage was large. The space for the audience was small, no seats. The man walked to the foot of the stage and said in a low voice, my house. This next little part I'm gonna read, um, I'm gonna post a link to it if you feel like attempting to follow along. Slightly altered, but. One night in late 2016, or maybe it was early 2017, Lisa and I went to Wat Buddha Metta, a Theravada Buddhist temple in Tucson, Arizona. We lived in Tucson from 2011 to 2014, left for two years, Marfa, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, Kure, Hiroshima, St. Louis, Portland, Oregon, and had just returned. We were exhausted from traveling and were seeking a place, a structure and a community in which to meditate. The night we first went was chanting night. When we entered, the monk Ajahn Saryat Arnanta was leading a group of 15 people in a chant of the Pali scriptures. 
He sat on a platform surrounded by tall vases overflowing with flowers. The flowers looked like the severed heads and necks of water birds. And in front of several Buddhas, including in the middle of all of the Buddhas, a golden Buddha. Looped around the golden Buddha were several white strings, Sai Sin and Tai, at least two that were connected to Ajahn Saryat's wrists, and at least one that shot out like spider silk over Ajahn Saryat's head and onto a wooden grid suspended from the ceiling. The white string passed through the grid where it seemed to multiply because many white strings hung down to the floor. The 15 people sat beneath the grid, each with a, with a piece of string coiled around their head. The string looked like the frosting on cinnamon buns. In this way, everyone was connected to the golden Buddha, to Ajahn Saryat, to each other. Their chanting intensified and deepened the beauty of the grid of white string because the rhythmic cicada-like sound of everyone's voice together transformed the white string from a means of connection into a mycelial form of communication. Everyone speaking to each other through the white string extra sensorially in the form of pure thinking. I am describing all this because I had a dream last week or two weeks or a few days ago, I'm have, having trouble keeping track about the grid of white string. I forgot about it, but shortly after entering quarantine, the white string returned. The dream was simple. It was raining, the rain was heavy, and yet there were places right next to the rain where it was not raining, as if there were columns of air immune to getting wet. And then in the middle of the rain and the columns of air without rain and the sound of it all appeared Wat Buddha Metta and the grid of white string. They appeared in a flash, except the room in the flash was empty of people. The golden Buddha was there. White string was looped around the golden Buddha, but Ajahn Saryat was not there and neither were the people. The white string was connected to the wooden grid and many white strings hung down to the floor. The fact that the 15 people who by the force of their chant had represented the world or the more infinite world beyond the visible world had been in my dream evacuated from the room was disconcerting, not only to me, but also it seemed to the white string. When we attended chanting night at Wat Buddha Metta, I paid more attention to the white string than I did to the people. But now in my dream with the people evacuated, I missed them and felt that something horrible had happened to them, something beyond evacuation, more violent. They had been disappeared. What about their voices? Some part of their voices, some resonance or recollection of pure thinking existed in the pathetic hesitancy of the white string. And with that, the flash burned out and it was raining and not raining again, end of dream. Today is Monday, March 30th, 2020. We used to go to the park five minutes away so that Yumi could run around. Then we stopped going to the park. Now we take walks around the neighborhood. It is spring, trees are green, flowers are in bloom. More flowers, Yumi says, walking through flowers. A menacing silence has befallen the world. I imagine that the silence and its menace is much louder, maybe even extremely loud in places that are not the desert, that are far from or inversions of the desert. As we walk through the neighborhood, people appear, young people, old people, people on bicycles, people with dogs, but they disappear just as quickly as if slipped through a sleeve in the more general mirage of sociality in the age of COVID-19. Although it feels more like the people are the mirage from which I cannot discount my family or myself. And it feels like the world, certainly the wide and languid streets of Tucson is the empty room beneath the grid of white string, which still in our absence connects us all, maybe even more intensely. People come back in our dreams to bring us their truth that which our eyes refuse to see and for which they burned us in burning themselves. 
That is from Atel Adnan's Time, translated from the French by the poet Sarah Riggs. I trust my dreams. I trust them especially when I do not trust myself to responsibly process what is happening outside of them. Is that what I'm trying to do now by remembering to myself my dream and the night three years or so behind it and the suddenly delirious and uncertain days before it? Because it feels like dreams have perfect timing. What originally appeared as a functional, however beautiful part of daily life returns years later in a dream transformed into the legend or explanation for life in general. Maybe explanation is not the right word. Maybe legend is not the right word either. The white string and the grid with which the white string is held and disseminated and from which it hangs down is powerful because it is precarious. If someone were to pull too hard on any one piece of the string, the whole thing would come down. Maybe the grid would come apart and the white string becomes so entangled in the pieces that the entire system would need to be gathered up and carried out into the desert. Today is Wednesday, April 1st, 2020. We just got back from a walk around the neighborhood. There were more and brighter, more fragrant and effusive, therefore more defiant and mocking flowers. And walking through them were people, young people, old people, people on bicycles, people with dogs, but everyone was keeping their distance. Would it be otherwise? And yet there was and has been something beatific about the faces above the flowers of people who have spent their days indoors, oscillating between depression and resignation, awareness and forgetting, and the simple agenda of trying to get on. What is a ghost? A soul that is desperate to return to that which no longer exists? or the soullessness that enforce, has enforced the increasing lack of existence. As we were walking through a stretch of bright yellow and orange daisies, Yumi bent over to smell them as she do, does with all flowers and declared simply, too many. I had a dream last night that I took Yumi to visit her great grandfather's grave. When we got there, his grave was gone and had been replaced with a white obelisk. Yumi sat down and, as if knowing exactly how to behave in front of it, closed her eyes. Inscribed on the obelisk were the words, Hydra Medusa. I had a dream last night that my grandfather, upset with the book I had written about him, attacked me. My grandfather was, when he died, small, he shrunk to less than five feet and his arms were skinnier than mine. But he had the fortification and the force of all of our dead behind him. And they too were upset with the book I had written. So his attack was their attack. I should have given into it because if their attack was sincere and if it satisfied the extent of their being upset, then I would soon be joining them and become part of that force. And yet, I tried to escape. I ran into a building, there was a cafeteria, people were eating at long tables, the tables had wheels. My grandfather, catching up to me, started pushing the tables with the people still sitting at them. He started pushing the tables into me. I laid down on the floor, hoping the tables would pass over. I had in my hands, with its spine against my neck, the book I had written about him. Thank you. The end. Very good. Very good. I'm clapping for you, man. All right. Um, <clears throat> looks like we have a couple of questions. I'm trying to. All right. Um, so this is an interesting question, I think, just to start. What? <clears throat> how do you draw the where do you draw the line between poetry and prose? 
do you think there's a line? This mm. is a question from uh, Lily Davis. Yeah, hi, Lily. Um, Lily's one of my students. Um, Lily's a brilliant writer. I, I should ask that question of Lily, but maybe Lily can't answer. Um, it's, I, I, feel like the, I feel like my attempt to answer that question um, is ongoing and that I'm always changing my answer because I, I, I used to think that I would go, but I was going back and forth between poetry and prose as if I was jumping over this line that hadn't been drawn on the ground and I was hopping from one side of the line to the other. Um, and maybe sometimes that's true, practically speaking, uh, but it, it, it took me a while, I think, to arrive at something that was maybe more honest and maybe more simple than that kind of um, hopping behavior was that, um, uh, at least for me as a writer, I have to embody both. I have to have both within me in order to write one or the other. So, I, I mean, I don't, maybe Lily, that's not really the question you're asking, but I feel like I can't, I, there is no prose without poetry. There's no poetry without prose. Um, and I was telling somebody, I think maybe it was even you, Lily, I was telling somebody the other, the other day that it felt like the dark and the light sides of the moon um, in the sense that the moon is one body and depending on, you know, um, the time of day or the sun, there's one side of that or one face of that is, that is more illuminated, but that the shadow of course is just as significant. Um, I, I wish, I wish Lily could respond to that. I, I, as I said, I think I'm always trying to figure that out. But I do know that when I'm struggling with one, the other one opens up more fully. And then when that one starts to like close in around me, the other one does the same. Um, so I think that just reinforces that maybe what I'm saying about them being, um, they're not being a line. If it's a line, it's a circle, maybe. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. If it's a line, it's a circle. Dang, <laughs> I love that. Cool. So, um, let's see. Uh, Paul O, our student, he asks, um, how do you find that spaces of dream and reminiscence interact or overlap in the practice of memoir? And what, if at all, do you find generative about their interplay? Oh yeah, that's good, Paul. Um, how do you find, in memoir in particular, in the practice of memoir. I like the phrasing of that because memoir does feel like a practice, like um, it's like a rehearsal, but then what's the performance? If memoir is the practice, what's the performance? I, you know, I think I've been thinking more and I think part of what I just read was me trying to figure out, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, um, my dreams were much more forthcoming and it felt like my conscious, my quote unquote conscious waking life was felt very chaotic. And um, I didn't feel like I had that much time or space to really put a, put a thought together. But yeah, my dreams were very clear and they seemed to possess a kind of intelligence that was being withheld from me when I was awake. So then I had to sort of imagine, well, maybe my intelligence exists at least for now in my dreams. And um, it's, not, it's not that, I, that, that I'm being called upon to interpret what my dreams are saying, but that my dreams themselves are the interpretation of, of what's going on um, in my life, in our lives around us, et cetera. So I started to really feel like there is a very particular logic that's being offered. Um, like a more humane, accessible logic that is that um, is being withheld from us in the brutal chaos of, of waking life. Um, so then it felt like um, if I were to transpose that idea onto the practice of memoir and thinking about maybe in the same way that dreams, because they happen and because they are offering themselves to us and they are ourselves offering ourselves to us in the form of dream, that there's a way that dreams can help problem solve the practice of memoir. 
you know, if we're stuck in like, uh, if we're trying to understand a relationship we, that we had or an experience that we had or our relationship to the ancestors and or the dead and the, um, and we are really struggling to articulate what that might be and put it down in the space of the memoir that a dream might provide us some sort of insight into that. What I like though, is that dreams also maybe don't necessarily need to be made use of. Um, maybe the perfect memoir, uh, dream related memoir is one that um, is, is un, remains unwritten. Um, is that, let me look at your question again. Is that, uh, but I'm thinking about that still because my dreams recently have been relatively non-existent. And I think that's because I wake up and I don't write them down. I've sort of fallen out of the, that very important practice of um, attending to them immediately. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, so uh, Divya Victor asks a question in the chat, um, which I'll read. Your work tonight and elsewhere is so interested in how relationships are built across lived time or quote, a lifetime, um, extending to elders who are strangers or mythological or ghosts. Um, could you speak some about how you imagine kinship beyond or alongside those who are not presently living people? Oh yeah. <laughs> I like the, how the question has um, brackets and quotation marks, Divya. Um, I feel um, <laughs> I feel intimidated thinking about that. Um, how how do I imagine kinship beyond slash alongside with those who are not presently living people? Um, I've, I've been feeling like, I spent a lot of time, I think, thinking about um, those who are not, quote, living people. Actually, my daughter has become really interested in ghouls. And we were trying to figure out the difference between ghouls and ghosts. Um, again, it, it, too bad she can't answer directly. She had a good answer for what a ghoul was yesterday that she told my sister. Um, I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I think one of the avenues of my thought is that anything I have to say about it feels kind of wildly presumptuous, um, motivated as it might be by this, this desire that I can't, that is sort of unanswerable, this unanswerable desire to connect with those who are, um, <laughs> to those who to those who are not living people. I had, this, I had this real revelation at some point when I was thinking about my grandfather, as I've been thinking about him probably unnecessarily for um, since he died in 1996. I say unnecessarily because um, he would probably find my obsession with him posthumously foolish. Um, you know, he was at least when, at least when he was alive, when I would, at least, when he was around and um, somewhat um, cognizant when I was young, um, he didn't speak very much about himself. So I feel like I've produced volumes of thought and volumes of writing um, sort of uh, antithetical to how private he seemed to be or my memory of him. But I, in, in the, the, the space of thinking about him, um, I started to see him slipping away from me into this collectivity, uh, which I began to define as the ancestors, which is, had nothing to do with individuals and had more to do with a group of not even people. Uh, I, I'm still struggling to figure out exactly what it does, was, but he was sort of drawn into this collective um, that uh, in a way seemed to be, exist more in the future than in the past. I started like thinking about the ancestors as something that is futural as, as opposed to something that is about people who have passed away, um, but maybe people who have passed into or have passed on in, into something else that I am living towards. Um, uh, and I mean, aside from that, I think um, I'm, still, I'm still trying to 
figure that out. I don't know if it's something that could, could be figured out. I'd love to ask you that question, Divya. Um, also thinking about kinship and in its wild variety. Oh, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah, there's a definition for ghouls. Is that Yumi? Is that Yumi's definition? Those are some pretty big words, but it's. it's I, I only want Yumi's definition of words. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like the, the dictionary I need. Yeah. Um, okay. I, so I think she. Uh, I think you're. You are her best friend too. By the way. Perfect. Perfect. That's my homie. All right. Um, so we have a question uh, from uh, from Jamil. Uh, oh, hey, a colleague in the art department. Um, how has traveling to Japan and being immersed in that culture affected your writing style um, as well as your relationship to writing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how has it affected my writing style? It's hard to know what my writing style is. Uh, I mean, I, maybe I'm, I'm not as um, equipped to, maybe I should be more aware of what my writing style is than I am. I think that um, uh, I first went to Japan when I was 10. Um, my father's Japanese, my mother is not, but she was the one who um, motivated us going there. My father had never been there before, but my mother was studying um, Japanese art history and Japanese religion and Japanese language. And um, so we went over there when I was 10. And I still think about that visit, even though I was a pretty ignorant 10 year old. Um, but there are things that, that happened during that trip things that I saw and experienced that I think I only really began to see and perceive maybe 20 or 30 years later and, I, and, and through writing. Um, so I don't know as much about the style, but I think that there were certain kind of indelible moments that required the passage of time and my ability to um, my hopefully like improving ability to write, to actually be present in those moments in Japan. Um, I mean, it's been hugely influential in, in terms of, um, well, maybe in, in too many ways to name. Um, and I think it's also connected to dreams. I think for a long time, it sort of occupied a dream space for me that I have since have since maybe felt that that was wrong, that I was relating to Japan and my own Japanese-ness and Japanese culture in a way that was not um, that was not actually um, bringing me to the place I needed to go. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting into some strange terrain, Jamil, but. Um, we obviously need to catch up. Uh, I, think, I think maybe even more than um, visiting Japan, which ha has been enormously influential just to my, I think my um, life and my way of thinking is, is Japanese and Japanese American writers. Um, some of whom preceded, I think, maybe my real deep immersion into being in Japan as a, as a, as a place. Um, the, the one of my favorite writers, I'm going to put him in the chat, um, Kawabata, Yasunari Kawabata. And he wrote one of my favorite books, which I, I read every single year, Palm of the Hand Stories. It's a series of very short stories, some of which are only a page in, in length. He was trying to um, translate the experience and the sensation and also like the rigor of a haiku into the short story form. And he worked very di diligently on these stories and some he revised 
not just many times, but over the course of his entire life. Um, so he would write one version of it and he would work on it for 30 years. So trying to perfect it. And I think that there's, there's certainly something about Japanese aesthetics in there, but I think that I'm responding to him first prior to him being a Japanese writer. Um, that might be one of the most, I think, um, impactful books on the way that I hope to write, even though my writing is, bears little um, relation to what he's doing. So, sorry, that was very sprawling. Wonderful. Um, okay, so we have a question uh, in the chat from a poet uh, who I think you may have heard of, Brandon. Uh, this is uh, from Dot Devota. Uh, her question is, do you think you might have created a new genre? And if so, what would that genre be called? Um, Dot Devota, by the way, is, is the next reader the Visiting Writer series on November 2nd. Um, and her book comes out next week. Her new book comes out next week. Um, I know that's not why she asked the question. It feels like a very leading question in that, uh, uh, do you think you might have created, I don't know what, it depends on what you're referring to. I would say no. I would say that nothing I've created is new. Um, but if I were to give it a name, maybe, I, maybe what would be new is the name that I would give it. Um, uh, because even my book, The Grave on the Wall, which is like, um, it's a combination of many things is really just, I mean, in addition to other things, it's really me speaking back to the writers that um, have sustained me. So it, you know, in the ways that I tell stories, it's, it's, it's speaking back to those storytellers in the way that I um, write a travelogue, it's speaking back to the people who are really good at writing the ways they move um, through space. Um, so it's, it's, like a form of thanks, I guess. I don't know if that's a genre. Um, uh, book length gratitude. Book length gratitude, I love that. All right, um, and then this, this will be our final question uh, from our introducer, Theo. Uh, Theo asks, uh, where or how would you place dreams on the spectrum of fiction versus nonfiction? Um, that's a good one, Theo. Um, I think we were talking briefly about this yesterday. I was thinking, right, like um, dreams are things that, that happen to us or that we happen into. They're things that we experience. The ways that we transcribe or translate those dreams into language to me is similar to the process of translating or graduating an experience into memory. And I would say that's nonfiction, although I don't know if I would call it fiction or nonfiction. I would, you know, because things that happen to us also could enter the realm of fiction. You're asking about the spectrum, but I think that dreams are, are just as non-fictive as, um, you know, what we did today. It is a part of what we did today. Uh, and maybe an even more depthful, um, significant part of, of what we did today and what we do every day. Um, it's definitely on the spectrum of fiction. I would also include it on the spec, I would include on that spectrum poetry, uh, as well as other things like um, community and um, apology. And um, if, you know, if we can spin out other types of genres. Um, but right, like dreams are real. Um, they, they happen. Wonderful. Dreams are real, they happen. That's, that's a beautiful note uh, to send us out on. 
Cool. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, of course, uh, thank you to Erica Hardcastle, who's been running the back end on this. Um, and again, thank the English department. Um, and be sure you can already like click the link and register for Dot's reading on November 2nd. Um, and so we hope to see you all there. And uh, yeah, thank you all. Have a good evening. Take Thanks. care. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brandon.